This is David Osteen, pastor of Hope Bible Church in Locust Grove, Georgia. And I want to deal with the question concerning head coverings. Is a Christian woman required to wear a head covering? And of course, this question comes from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 3 to 16. And we'll try to read through the passage and make some brief comments. We'll not have time in a short video like this to expound the passage in any depth. But try to just get the basic idea of what's being taught. And I believe the point in the passage is not that a woman has to wear a certain kind of uh, garment or cloth on her head, but rather that a Christian woman should show forth in her conduct that she is in submission uh, to her husband, that she follows God's order. Now, there are still churches today uh, where they make a big deal about their women wearing something on their head. And uh, in America, uh, from what I've seen, it's usually like this little piece of cloth or a hat and they really take pride in it because most churches don't do that. And so they think, boy, we're really right. You know, this is something we do and others don't do. And it's a religious thing. Uh, Paul's not teaching that at all. And by the way, at that time when Paul's writing this in that culture, the head covering was not a, a little piece of cloth. It was a veil that covered the whole head. It, it, I mean, it really covered them. And he's not saying in the passage that... All believers uh, in every culture throughout uh, the grace age has to wear that same kind of thing. The point is not the garment. The point is the submission, the attitude of the heart. That's really the issue. Now, you, if you understand anything uh, about 1 Corinthians, you know that it's, this is a letter full of rebuke and correction. The church at Corinth was a carnal church, and they had many problems. One of those problems was they were out of order in their public meetings. And in this chapter, in the latter part of the chapter, they're out of order concerning the Lord's Supper. And he straightens that out. He says at the end of the chapter, in verse 34, the rest will I set in order when I come. Well, the beginning part of the chapter, he's setting things in order concerning women in the church. Evidently, there were some women at Corinth, the church at Corinth, they were out of order. And so he's rebuking that and correcting that. Verse 3, but I would have you know, that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now that's very important, this issue of headship, the way things are set up by the Lord. Um, you know, saying that the head of the woman is the man does not make the woman of any less value. It does not degrade the woman. It does not say the woman is inferior, because the passage says the head of Christ is God. And we know that Christ is co-equal with the Father and the Spirit in the Godhead. There's one God in three persons. These three are one, and yet there's an order in the Godhead in that the Spirit glorifies the Son and the Son the Father. Uh, there's an order, and yet they are co-equal. In fact, in Philippians 2, where it says that Christ was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, he was in perfect submission to the Father's will. In that very passage, it says that uh, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And there are many passages in the Bible that make it clear that Jesus Christ is God. So when it says the head of Christ is God, that is not degrading him in any way. So understand, and this is, you know, I don't have time to really get into this issue and teach on it in this short video because the video is about answering the question about if a woman has to wear a head covering. But the principle is clear here, I think. And there are many verses to look at along these lines. But let's read on. Verse 4, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. His head is Christ. It's dishonorable to Christ for a man to get up in the public meeting and prophesy with his head covering or, or, or uh, head covered or pray with his head covered. Now, let me, let me just say this briefly, that uh, the gift of prophecy, the sign gift, the spiritual sign gift of prophecy has ceased, according to 1 Corinthians 13. There's no need for it today. And I dealt with that not too long ago in one of our Q&A videos. I can't remember which number it is, but uh, we did deal with the issue of sign gifts. So nobody today is getting up and speaking by the Spirit of God in prophecy. But at this time, in the Acts period, uh, these gifts were still in use. Verse 5, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. She's dishonoring her head as in her husband. Uh, for her to get up in the public meeting, praying and prophesying with her head uncovered, showed that she's not in submission. He said, For that is even all one as if she were shaven. 
For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, he's going to go on the passage a little bit later and talk about how a woman's hair is given to her for a covering. And it's her glory. So then it would be a shame for her to be uh, shaven. That would be, look rather masculine. It would be a shameful thing. And the commentators tell us that at Corinth, the temple prostitutes had shaved heads. I don't know. Uh, I just go by what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say what the temple prostitutes dressed like. I'm sure they. it was obvious they were temple prostitutes, so maybe that's the case. But at any rate, it's a shame. It's a shame, he said, then let her be covered. Now, this thing of every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, well, certainly a woman could pray or prophesy without being in a position of leadership and authority over men. Uh, in Luke chapter 1, Verse 41, it came to pass that when Elizabeth, this is the mother of John the Baptist, heard the salutation of Mary, uh, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and so on. So Elizabeth here is speaking by the Holy Ghost, and yet she's not up in a pulpit preaching to men, is she? She's talking to Mary. All right, in Acts chapter 21, verse 8, the next day, uh, we that were of Paul's company departed, came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist. Now, uh, you recall that Philip was out of the Jerusalem church, the kingdom church, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. No details are given. It doesn't say they got up and prophesied to men as though they were an authority over the men. It just made mention of the fact they did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And, you know, Agabus prophesies to Paul and gives him a message. Well, what was the point of that if those women were there to do that? See, you know, people jump on things like this and they read a lot into it that's not there. That's it. There's nothing said by Paul in his church epistles about women, you know, prophesying in the public meeting. And he brings it up, except for in 1 Corinthians 11, where he brings it up in the context of rebuke. And he's, he's not teaching here that a woman should prophesy in the public meeting, because that would contradict his instructions in other passages, as in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34 to 35, 1 Timothy 2, verse 11 to 14, where what's being taught, and we just dealt with this in our last video, Q&A uh, video, uh, about women being silent in the church. He's not saying that a woman can't talk at church. He's saying that she's to be silent uh, in regard to leadership and authority. She's not to usurp authority over the man. And uh, that's clear in those passages. And Paul's not contradicting himself here. You know, the kind of woman who would try to get up in the public meeting to prophesy would be the same kind who would do so with her head uncovered, showing she was not in submission. He said, Every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered. This is not a, a, a statement here where he's commending, he, he's rebuking. And, and he said she's dishonoring her head by doing so. For that is even all of one as if she were shaven. You know, it's obvious that, you know, people think that, well, if a woman was prophesying, she must have been doing the right thing. But you understand at Corinth, they had all the sign gifts and they were doing it wrong. They were out of order in how they used the sign gifts. Evidently, there was women at Corinth in the church trying to speak with tongues in the meeting. And Paul said a woman was to, to be silent in, in, when it came in the context of speaking with tongues, 1 Corinthians 14. So uh, evidently, there were women there trying to do that. And there were women also trying to prophesy. And he does not commend that. He brings it up in the context of rebuke. Verse 7, For a man indeed ought to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. What does he mean by that? He explains, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Some people try to say that uh, the man being the head of his wife, that's a result of the fall in Genesis 3. But you know what? That's not true because when God created man in his own image, he formed him out of the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul. And then when it came time to make a help meet for Adam, he took one of his ribs. You know what happened in Genesis 2? He made the woman, brought her to the man. 
and made her for the man. And in marriage, two become one, but he called their name Adam. The man is the head of the woman. That's the way, that's the order of creation. And he alludes to that in 1 Timothy 2 about a woman not usurping authority over the man. He said in verse number 13, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. And uh, so he says in verse number 10, for this calls off the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. The power on her head has to do with showing her submission to authority. Power here has to do with authority. And he says, because of the angels. Now, the question's always been, is that talking about um, evil angels or holy angels? And that's another question for another day. But I think that both observe what's going on in the church. And uh, he's saying, you know, a woman needs to be concerned about her testimony, not only because of what people will see, but even the angelic realm takes note. Verse 11, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man and the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so the man also by the woman, but all things of God. And so they're interdependent. In other words, there's a distinction, there's an order, and yet the woman would not exist unless you know God brought her forth out of the man, and yet a man can't come into this world unless he's born of a woman. Uh, but he's saying all things are of God. In other words, it's got to do with God's order, the way he set things up. And, and God designed the man to meet the needs of the woman and the woman to meet the needs of the man. And there must be that distinction between the sexes and that order. And when and when you get rid of the distinction, you get rid of the order, everything gets really messed up and confused. And that's the kind of culture we live in today. People have lost their minds when it comes to these kind of things. They don't even know the difference between a man or woman, they act like they're insane because they've gotten away from the Word of God. There's only two genders, male and female. Marriage is between one man and one woman. The Bible's clear on this, regardless of what our nutty culture thinks. It doesn't matter. We go by the Bible. The Bible is the authority. So he goes on to say, Judging yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? In other words, is it, is it becoming? Is it proper? Is it suitable for a woman to pray unto God? She's going to come to God uncovered, showing she's not even submission to her husband. How is she going to be in submission to God? She can't even submit to her husband. In Ephesians 5, Paul talked about a wife submitting to her husband uh, as the church submits to Christ. She is to submit uh, to her husband, and uh, boy, that's so important to have that order. And she's to do that as unto the Lord. It's God's will. It's God's word. And by the way, when Paul says what he does in verse 13, he doesn't say anything about a woman prophesying here. He just mentions a Christian woman praying uh, unto God. So again, nowhere in the passage does Paul teach that a woman is to get up in the public meeting and prophesy. Verse 14, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? It is against nature, and it's a sin for a man to be effeminate, and it's effeminate for a man to have long hair. Okay, that's and that's still true in 2018. And verse number uh, 15, But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Okay, it, it, it shows forth that order, and it's the way God intended it to be. Now, there's no rules laid down here that it has to be hair all the way to the floor. And it has to be all these details of things. That's People get carried away with this stuff, but there's a basic principle. I think it's very clear. There needs to be a clear-cut distinction between the sexes. Now, verse 16, But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. In other words, there's no other custom recognized by the apostles of the churches. So there's no sense arguing about it. Paul writes here the Word of God and shows the order, goes all the way back to creation, shows the way God set things up. It's so important that we follow the Word of God. He knows what he's talking about. He's the Lord. We need to be in submission to him and to his Word. Uh, there's more I'd like to say, but our time is up. But that's basically what's going on in the passage here. It has to do with submission. And no, a woman does not literally have to wear a certain kind of cloth or garment on her head. That's not the point in the passage. So if you have a question, leave a comment, send me an email, hopebiblechurchga at att.net. We would love to hear from you. Thank you for watching.